Good afternoon, Lace Jump and I'm John, this is many a true nerd, and welcome back to Skies of Arcadia. Where last time, we took the Delphinus higher than she's ever been before. And today, we're going to be doing precisely the opposite, going down into the depths of the sky to track down the Yellow Moon Crystal. Before that though, okay, I can't deny, this gigantic, highly expensive fountain, it's just not really doing it for me. Though tragically, if you go to Kerala and ask her to, yes, modify the statue once it's already the gigantic cupel form, she does actually, yes, seem a bit disappointed that you're taking it down. And I am sorry, Kerala, but yes, I do indeed want you to go back to the old style fountain. Anyway, that done, let's get back out to the sky. Just hopping over to the map for a second, yes, we know where the Moor of Tartus is, so uh, therefore we know uh, roughly where we want to go. If we like, you know, navigate to underneath there, that should be roughly the right location. But obviously, given the game knows you're going to be exploring under Valois, this is where a large number of the Undersky discoveries can be found. There was a general rule, you're not going to find too much in the Undersky next to the Oversky. There's a lot more going on in Upper Sky, and... Uh, here we flip it. Go one, a very cocking obvious one, the dancing lights. Said to be caused by electricity from the yellow moonstones in the Valoran soil, though some say it is caused by a giant creature that lies deep inside the ground. So, right, that might just be, you know, a very useful indicator as to roughly where you're supposed to go. That's kind of supposed to, you know, guide you in the right direction. So, uh, don't worry about them for now. There's a few more things around here I wouldn't mind just, you know, picking up first. Though, yes, basically, those lights are designed to guide you into the right location. Here we flip it. Go, we're very nearby. There's a very convenient island located right under the sky here. And that leads us to the Valoran Wreckage. 20 years ago, a flagship of the Armada disappeared above a northern Nazrat near the end of the Valoran Nazrum War. Some theories mention a murder attempt on the commander of the Armada, but the mysterious disappearance has never been fully explained. We are for reference, yes, right next to the north of Danil Strait, so you know, a prime territory for fighting between Valor and Nazra, so uh, yes indeed, hints there are some sort of conspiracy involving a downed Valoran Admiral, and uh, okay, there's you know, a, a few ways we could interpret that information, we'll come back to that later, just you know, uh, keep it in mind for down the line. And one more if we just head back to, yes, the Dancing Lights, but then instead head due and northwards. And this one's just cocking delightful. You have found uh, the Rabbats. So, yes, like, rabbit bats. And they're like, you know, uh, switch around uh, with their ears. Strange creatures that spend their entire lives hanging upside down by digging their claws into the rock face. Until it was discovered underneath the Valoran continent, it was thought to be a myth. Its intelligence and ferocity belie its cute appearance. So, uh, yes, basically there's just, you know, a giant, terrifying rabbit bats hanging on the bottom of Alawa. I like this discovery. This is a good discovery. Still, back to the dancing lights right here. Just, you know, helping to uh, guide us in. There is a tunnel literally right next to them. And that will get us inside the Valoran continents. Bringing us, in fact, to the second dungeon that takes place inside your ship. The first being the Dark Rift. And just like the Dark Rift, this location is a little bit of a maze. Together with, you know, obviously being a standard environment for your ship, so you can be attacked at random too. And as for the locals, right, weird flying electric eels one assumes as we're, you know, under Valor and whatnot. And also weird floating yellow eggs with glistening yellow head McJibbles. Though, um... Yes, fascinatingly, none of them are colour-coded yellow, which I find bloody weird, but fine. And yes, I suspect at this point, Lambda Burst probably isn't going to do the job particularly well against even large numbers of enemies. You know what? We'll give you a go, just see how that works out. So, right, one good, lovely Lambda Burst, though, okay, if this doesn't work, and my team's now strong enough that, yes, we do have... Uh... Oh dear, not quite... We do now have, yes, enough spirit to consider giving a small upgrade to Ica. Here we go, Ica's last super move. Going up from, yes, Lambda Burst, costing 8 special in order to hit every enemy, up to instead 12. And, yes, we can now afford to do that on the first turn of the fight. So, 
Ica summons the powers of the Red Moon to destroy all enemies on screen. And, uh, okay, honestly, this is not that good a move, but it's also, like, you know, incredibly over-the-top anime nonsense. And we're swimming in moonberries, so go on then, Omega Cyclone, why not? Okay, we'll test that out in just a second, but yes, like the Dark Rift, this place is a bit of a maze. So, uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure ultimately we want to go up in that direction, but okay. Before we, like, you know, uh, start doing all the side rooms and whatnot, any chance we've got ourselves. Uh, right, a group of enemies, and you guys just survived a lambda burst, didn't you? So, uh, okay, everyone stand back. This one's on Cocking Oika. This is possibly the biggest, most ridiculous anime nonsense in the game, by the way. So, uh, alright, step one, draw a gigantic fire hexagon, trigger gigantic, you know, nonsense, etc, etc, and we're not cocking done yet because I could just basically drops a cocking nuke on the enemy. It's basically a nuclear bomb. And it does 500 damage, which is just sad, given it costs almost as much as Raid of Swords. That's just sad. It is, however, possibly the most ridiculously, you know, over-the-top move in the game, which I do quite like. So, uh, right, mosey round to the right first, as I was saying, and... Uh, Yes, what we're looking out for is uh, particularly unusually coloured rock formations. Because they function like the shipwrecks do in the Dark Rift. Here we go. This room looks nice and on the fancy side. We've got a glowing transparent crystal and whatnot. And uh, with that, we get another cocky Dexa seed. So yes, particularly fancy glowing rocks. That's what we're looking for. Anyway, turn back on ourselves, back the way we came, because yes, this dungeon isn't particularly difficult to navigate. It's just, you know, a, a bit on the long side, and, uh, hello there, sexy. Right, we've got different coloured weird floating creatures on this occasion. You know what, Ica? Give it a go, we'll back you up with a yes, a Fina, and a lovely sexy Pyrrhon box. That should be just a fine. Right, just let her drop a nuke on the field, and, uh, okay. Almost took them out. Not quite. We just need Athena to, you know, ramp things up a bit there. Okay, back to the central cavern. This time, yes, take a right, what would have been a left for the first time we came into the room, and keep on keeping on. Also, I say this dungeon's not that complicated. Obviously, suddenly I can't remember where I'm supposed to be going next. Hang about. Okay, right was the side passage last time. I'm going to assume a left is going to be the side passage this time. Though, uh, I'm pretty sure at this point the only other bit of, uh, yes, optional loot in this dungeon is uh, one Moonberry. And really, do we need another Moonberry? We've got more than we know what to cocky do with. Oh, there we go. My metagaming worked out perfectly. If the side room was the right branch the first time, it's gonna be the left the second. So, uh, right, mosey over to uh, here. Excuse me, I know you're an optional thing, please. Uh, and there we go, yet another Moonberry. Oh, and something absolutely cocking and wonderful just happened in the tunnels under Valois. Fina has finally learned to increment. So, uh, yes, up to now she could just increase the power and defense of uh, one person, which we have never done because you could just use, you know, a glyph of might for that. But she now knows increment. 16 spirit, which I'll admit is a lot, but it means she can increment the entire team in one go. And that is really, really cocking useful on occasion, yes. Because uh, even if you're not doing physical attacks, physical defense 25%, that's bloody invaluable. Like, you know, uh, stack that with Justice Shield and uh, you can tank some really cocky big hits, damn it. Anyway, back to that main room, take the right instead of the left, and uh, you may notice there's a save point up ahead because, um, that's the entire dungeon right there. Yes, when I said at the end of Glacier that at some point Sega ran out of uh, time, money, and ideas, uh, the Yellow Moon Crystal section is, yes, that taken uh, to its absolute cooking extreme. Seriously, this was put together in five minutes on the last day before they had to ship the game. But as I say, don't worry, because all this means is uh, we can get to the game's uh, fantastic multi-part final act even cooking sooner. 
Right, coward saver down, just in case of trouble. Let's mosey on forward and see, yes, what's going on in the next room. And you may notice, yes, architecture that looks a bit familiar. Very similar to the rocks around the Moor of Tartus. So just, you know, bring the ship up nice and slow and careful. And as we just go up and up and up in this room, yes, indeed. As you may have guessed, that mysterious spiky thing dead ahead of us is the currently dormant yellow Giga. So, all right, keep on keeping on. And maybe you don't get, like, you know, too close to it, guys. It might be a bit of a bad idea just to keep on up, trying not to bump into it. But, yes, I think it might be starting to move. And that is Yelaga, the Yellow Giga. And okay, for now, it seems to be nice and chill, because the Sylvine Mages put him to sleep. Then they sealed him in here, Yelaga is extremely powerful, it's best we don't wake him up. The crystal is in his possession, we have to find a way to remove it without waking him. Which I'm guessing may at some point have been, you know, a thing we did in the game, but instead, no. He just, uh, wakes up immediately. I swear, like, you know, you can see the signs that they were planning for the Yellow Crystal mission to be way more complicated, but then they just ran out of time and or money, and instead, he just wakes up straight away, so I guess we better shoot him with cannons. Still, there is one advantage to him waking up, and that is, yes, his power is enough to destroy the seal straight away, meaning we've got a shortcut back out into the sky, and that's precisely where he's going. Because yes, just like Blueheim, he can cocking fly, obviously. So, right, out into the skies, let's see what we can do to you, buddy. Okay, nothing too complicated to start us off. A pretty safer first turn. The Giga's still, you know, waking up, maybe a bit sleepy, etc, etc. So, alright, just drop some torpedoes on it, get the apple wax in play, and no trouble whatsoever. So yeah, we've got a moment at the start of the fight just to, you know, charge up, give him a poke, etc, etc. Because uh, I think we're supposed to assume, like, you know, uh, he's not really properly woken up yet, alright? He's still a bit on the sleepy side, it's fine. Still, just to get the torpedoes up into the air, we've got a crit turn coming up next. So, uh, yeah, bare minimum, uh, we could give him a poke. And uh, here we go, uh, attack number one. Photon charge, so uh, just a bunch of electrical bolts coming in, and uh, okay, 2000, really not that bad, we weren't even guarding, so okay, time to return a fire, main cannons, torpedoes, etc, and uh, oh yeah, in a straight slugging match, I think we could just, you know, uh, take him. The Delphinus in the late game is really, really cocky powerful, if you bother to set it upright. And okay, we've got one regular turner here, a more dangerous turn coming in too, but we might be able to get a yes, double critical on round three. So honestly, probably the best bet would just be, yeah, prepare yourselves for this turn, just, you know, charge up, make sure Apple Wax is still going to be present next turn, because otherwise it would wear out if we didn't reapply it right now. And instead, yeah, just basically get ready to lay down the fire next round. So we can use, yes, Urala to max out my spirit points, Maga flipping Nificence. And beyond that, yeah, just make sure we've got torpedoes are flying it into the round that actually matters. Oh, and here we flipping go, Voltigar. So yes, he's a photon bursting, he could just do that anytime. It's not really that strong, but yeah, when it starts going yellow, then he's gonna crack out the bigger attacks, which actually did less damage because Vise was in command and he guarded. And uh, yeah, Vise is well set up defensively at this point. So, okay. Torpedoes get launched and no flipping a trouble there. Lovely. And yeah. At this point, we should be in a good position to absolutely cocking annihilate him next turn. But, first up, okay. He's kind of flat, we should try attacking from above or below. Might be easier to hit it that way, so... Okay, this is kind of a guess in a way, but yes, the correct answer is below. And I'm guessing you're supposed to realise that because, yeah, that's where, like, you know, all his delicate pointy bits are. So, yes, below is the right answer, I believe. 
And there we flippy go. We've now got ourselves a two credits. So, okay. This is precisely what I wanted to cocking say. So right, if I get a regular shot in, Ike is obviously just going to be firing non-stop for the entire turn. Meaning I guess Athena may as well just fire a torpedo into the next round too, where we've also got a Moonstone Cannon coming up. Though, honestly I'm kind of curious whether yes, we might be able to finish him off for this round. Like, we're laying down a lot of cocking fire here. So okay. Opening up with our ridiculous pile of spirits. I mean, there's 7k, and that wasn't even, you know, a, a cocky critical round. Still, he's laying down the fire to a Voltigar coming in, but yes, honestly, even though we're not guarding this round, 2.5k. Uh, like, the Delphinus is strong enough to go toe to toe with a Giga. It's not so bad. So, uh, right, everything comes in, and uh, blimey. Okay. We're not going to kill it this round, but we've seriously got his number. And that was just, you know, one round. We're going to do that again next round. Like, you know, here we flipping go. Cannons, sub-cannons, etc, etc. 30k. That must have been a crit right there, because that was Enrique. He shouldn't be doing that much damage. So, oh yeah, that'll flip and do. Like, the one thing this guy's got is uh, he attacks a lot. But like, you know, his regular day-to-day -day attack, the photon charger... It's not spectacular. Like, by this point of the game, the Delphinus has just got enough hit points to weather the storm. So, the lad's in a bit of a trouble. Obviously, we've got the Moonstone Cannon also on a red turn. So, yes, given we've got a flipping turn the following turn, use the Moonstone Cannon to knock him off balance. Not particularly complicated, though. Okay. I wouldn't mind laying down a bit more fire on him in general, but that would mean a yeah. I might not have enough spirit to fire the Moonstone Cannon next round, which we might still need to do. So, okay. I can't. How about you just... Oh, hang on. We're not under Appawax anymore, dear oh flippin' dear. Right, I can get that back on before it's Moonstone time. Fina, you can just uh, focus, and Rike, you, you may as well fire, because yes, I think we may be able to finish him off uh, this round if we're lucky. So... Uh, here we go, another 18,000, so, oh yeah, this has got to be enough. He's preparing for his ultimate red attack, but if we're lucky, we may be able to kill him before he can even get it off. And speaking of which, here we flippy go. So, right, Moonstone Cannon comes out, and, I mean, surely, this has got to be enough for the kill right here. Given how much we've been doing to him, we're just like, you know, conventional cannons are... 43,000, uh, down he goes, uh, he may or may not be dead again, it's hard to tell when it's Giggers, uh, but you know, uh, he's gonna crash down to the ground, everything's fine, and even better. Just like we, you know, uh, once cut off a bit of Grendel to be Iker's weapon, uh, on this occasion, a little bit's fallen off of this guy, giving Vise a brand new swords. Still, we'll get to that in just a second. The yellow Giga falls to the ground. Yet another nuclear explosion. There's been a lot of them. I can stop cheering. There's just been a nuke. Down he goes into a gigantic crater. And uh, yes, the shining light, obviously, is the yellow crystal. And uh, okay, on this occasion, I think he literally exploded. Right, well, that one I feel like, you know, you can't argue one way or the other. On this occasion... I'm pretty confident the yellow Giga is dead. And that is literally it for the yellow crystal. Alright, you go into that cave, you go to the end, you fight the yellow Giga, you've got the crystal. Nothing else happens whatsoever. They just straight up ran out of time. Still, this is now the fifth moon crystal. We're making fast progress, Fina, you're not wrong. And now, my quest is finished. After all. Don't forget, she's mentioned previously, the Silver Elders already had the Silver Moon Crystal, meaning, technically, Fina's now done. I mean, she should probably at this point, you know, go home, deliver them. That's it, it's finished. Though, she's not necessarily that delighted at the possibility of leaving her friends behind. And there we go. Staring off into space, she's got nothing else to say for now. Still, we've got a crystal. That's not a bad thing. And as for the sword we got, right. At the moment I'm using the wind slicer that can slice the air in a half. And we can now change to uh, the thunder cutlass that can cut through lightning. 
Okay, both impressive statements right there. But, um, yes. The Thunder Cutlass is uh, ever so slightly better. So probably best we go over to that. Right, just a nip above the sky. After all, if you're above the sky, that means Valor can't in any way, you know, uh, catch me or anything. Because their ships can't get up here. And head east to return to Crescent Isle. There we go, I see it straight below, so just drop down a straight into position, and boom. Seriously, the yellow moon crystal section is uh, weirdly short, it's absolutely wild, and uh, we've got a pleasant surprise waiting for us back at base too. Uh, Guild has shown up, and uh, okay, seriously, can everybody stop putting their boots on my map table? Do I need to put a sign up on the door? I heard you sailed all around the world. As always, kid, it sounds like you've been trying to get yourself into more and more trouble. I came to hear all about your travels. And for a good meal. Okay, now that we could do. We have got a lovely Yafu Toman restaurant downstairs. And given it's now dark outside, sometime later I assume, you went to Yafu Toma and then are on to the Land of Ice. Just listening to your stories makes my adrenaline flow, and we've even got all the crystals set out on the table here. Lovely. And so in the end, you collected the five moon crystals. Nice work. And since they're together, I suppose that means Fina will be taking them with her when she heads home soon, and uh, that's true, Gilda. But I feel like, you know, Fina didn't really want her reminding about that yes this is now you know a, a bit of a sore spot for fina i'm not sure she actually wants to go there was something that was bothering me from earlier fina where exactly did you come from i mean where are you going home to and all right we've heard of vague mentions about this in the past but she's always been you know a, a bit light on the detail and we might finally get a bit of an answer but as i say this is maybe a bit of a sore topic for her. The place to which I must return, the place where both Ramirez and I were born and raised, is the Great Silver Shrine. It is in a place high above the sky. And alright, you've mentioned the place before, but yes, never in any detail. Long ago, when the rain's destruction fell upon the land and most of the world's population was killed, all seemed lost. The most powerful Silphite mages met at the shrine. They combined their energy to send it into the sky, above the destruction. They escaped the horrible fate that fell upon the rest of the world, by rising above it. Ever since then, from above, we have sworn to protect the people of this world from the same fate that our ancestors suffered. That is the primary mission of the remaining Silphites. The Great Silver Shrine is high above the clouds, where no ship can reach it. Presumably, not even our ship with its current upgrades. I plan to take the Moon Crystals back to the Great Silver Shrine, so that no one can ever abuse their power again. And Enrique raising the obvious question, how precisely are you planning to get there? If it's like, you know, so far up that even our ship can't get there. And if I can get back the ship that I came in, I should be able to make it home. You may recall, of course, yes, yeah, she was in a very small ship during the introductory cutscene. One that, you know, Alfonso bombed and then abandoned once he'd brought her aboard. And yes, indeed, when I was attacked by Valoa, my ship sank beneath the clouds. So okay, that ship's off limits, so we need to find another way to get Fina home. And if we find a way to get Fina back home, right, I think Ica might be, you know, addressing what Fina doesn't want to say out loud. Does that mean we'll have to say goodbye? We'll never get to see her again. And okay, I feel like yes, that's very much something that was playing on Fina's mind too. Sometimes I find myself thinking. I started thinking, if I can't find a way home, maybe I'll be able to stay here with everyone. <sighs> and okay, I think maybe Fina doesn't really want to go home anymore, but yeah, she's now kind of, you know, torn between her friends and her duty. Meanwhile, elsewhere... Right, checking in with Aloha, let's see what's going on with them. Ramirez, what is the status on the construction of Dangrel Island? The construction of the port is complete, and Deluco's flagship is currently being fitted so it can submerge into Deep Sky. I've also received word that the elevator leading to the bottom of Deep Sky is being completed as well. <laughs> Excellent. The time grows near. Soon the foolish empress and the rest of the people of the world will bow before my might. No, not just the people, the people and even those revered moons.
Thrones. Soon, they will all be in my grasp. So, uh, right. Sounds like, you know, one, Gaussia might not be entirely loyal to the Empress, and two, he might have somewhat lost it. Still, if he has, Ramirez doesn't seem to see it. You shall reign supreme, Lord Gaussian. So, alright. He's still on board with the take over the world and also make the moons bow down to me plan. Tomorrow morning, I leave for Dangro. I wish to oversee the final stages of construction myself. And tell the other admirals to assemble at Dangro. I wish to know where they stand. So, uh, right. By the sounds of it, yes. Things might be about to start accelerating over in Avalawa. And I walk a path of death and destruction. I know you are a Sylvite. If you wish to change your mind, uh, now is the time. And I chose long ago to walk the path that you walk upon, Lord Gaussian. I shall forever be at your side. And I will cut down any of those uh, that block our path. It is my duty. It is my purpose. So, uh, right. Ramirez has certainly changed a bit from what we heard from Doc previously. At some point, yes, we're going to need to uh, fill in the blanks as to precisely how Ramirez ended up this loyal to Gaussian. Meanwhile, back at Crescent Isle, a right bright new morning. Lovely. And on top of that... Okay, I can't deny. That is a much nicer fountain. I'm sorry, I know you tried really hard with the cupel fountain, but I think this one's just better, damn it. And you know what? Speaking of Kerala, I wouldn't mind getting her to, yes, redo the actual main bunkhouse here, because uh, this is better than how it used to be, but I would like to see the Yafu Toman version, just to see if, you know, maybe I like it a bit more. Meanwhile, just nip downstairs and Gilda interrupts you before you can leave. Visa, thanks for the food. It was delicious. And Gilda, you're leaving already, and uh, you know what? It's not too surprising. Gilda does just kind of, you know, come and go on occasion. But he does have a one interesting bit of good news for us. I found out some information on the Armada's latest project. I just heard about this the other day. It appears that Valoa has begun advancing into the lower altitudes. I heard that north of Pirate Isle, somewhere beneath the clouds, they're building a base on Dangrel Island. So, right, precisely what we just heard being discussed by Gaussian and Ramirez. It's just a rumour, but I heard they're building a ship that can go into deep sky. So, right, upper sky and lower sky we've been able to do so far. But deep sky, that's even below what Yafu Toma can pull off. Deep sky is basically... The surface. Because yes, the world of Arcadia does kind of have a surface, and uh, potentially, that's where Valor is trying to go next. Though I do like that, you know, this idea is so weird and strange to the people of Arcadia, that they don't really have a word for surface. To these guys, that's a weird, strange concept that doesn't make sense. And Vi's raising the obvious question here, why go to all this trouble to get down to, you know, a, a mysterious dark dead nightmare? And I don't know, but Fina's ship sank beneath the clouds, right? And yes, indeed, you're correct. That must be what they're after. One of the crystals is held by the Sylvites, and they go to need Fina's ship to get to it. So uh, probably best we go and check out this island ourselves. So okay, straight down below the clouds once again. As I say, there's not as much going on down below as there is in the upper sky. But there are still a few bits and pieces, and uh, Dangrel Island that just got highlighted to us, uh, that's by far the most interesting. Together with the odd squid, we just picked up a squid there. My favourite area being, yes, round the lands of ice. There's a couple of uh, rather interesting things are floating around here. So, uh, yes, just north of uh, the main land of ice continent, we have got ourselves uh, the Southern Cross right here. Basically, a gigantic ancient signpost made out of ice, pointing towards the ruins of ice, which is rather delightful, and does imply that yes, the entire purple civilization may have primarily lived below the clouds, given, you know, their city is primarily accessed from below, and various landmarks connected to them are also found in lower sky. And then if we just head yes, eastwards from that direction, towards the area where we found the giant squid back in the day, here we go, we find ourselves completely invisibly somewhere in this area, the Ancient Fish. 
a species of fish previously believed to be extinct millions of years ago. Its vestigial gills and fins that look like hands and feet seem to point to an evolutionary path from water to land and then up into the sky. So uh, yes, there's just, you know, a, a gigantic floating catfish dotted about here. There you go, lovely to see you, buddy. Anyway, let's get back to business because, yes, they said north are from Pirate Isle. So, uh, right, just get back to Pirate Isle, go into Lower Sky because that's where we're supposed to be going, turn north and see what suddenly appeared on the map. Here we go, I'm seeing an island and I'm also seeing a giant terrifying swirling maelstrom. And on a rock right by the two, we've got the Flying Machine. An odd looking machine whose origins are a complete mystery. So, uh, right, a lovely ancient flying canoe. I love it. And, uh, yes indeed. Its construction has led to theories about the ship being built on another world. Uh, some even going so far as to say uh, that it travelled through areas without air. So, uh, do bear in mind, uh, we're currently under the Silver Moon. The Silver Civilization we now know basically built space stations, went to space, etc, etc. So uh, I would speculate this here is an ancient Silvite vessel, the prototype for what Fina came in. Still, just keep on keeping on and uh, that to me looks a lot like a port based in Lower Sky, which thankfully appears to be almost completely unguarded, presumably because, well, as we know, Valuan ships can't get this deep down. This is basically undefendable space, so... Uh, Right, meanwhile inside the island, uh, the meeting that Gaussian was just mentioning. So, Admirals of the Valoran Armada, I have urgent news that affects all of you. And ho ho, words of wisdom from the Grand Admiral himself. Please, enlighten us. I love Alfonso, I'm so glad Alfonso's back round the table, damn it. From this day forward, uh, the Armada will no longer be under the Empress's control. And okay, that certainly caused some consternation around the table. Those that do not wish to walk the path I have chosen, leave now. Those that wish to hear my plans, please stay. And what? What is this? And Admiral Gaussian, do you know what you're saying? So okay, Gregorian Alfonso immediately not keen on this, potentially. <sighs> have you gone insane, Gaussian? Are you rebelling against the Empress? <laughs> And fear not, Alfonso, I still have my wits about me. I am following my own path. It's your decision whether or not you wish to follow me. <laughs> so, Gaussian finally shows his true intentions. Those words are treasonous. The punishment is death. And oh dear, I'm not sure you want to, you know, threaten Gaussian while Ramirez is in the room. If you speak in that manner again, I shall cleave you in two. No! And what? What do you mean? Okay, stuff's kicking off on Dangrel Island, gotcha! And wait, Ramirez, uh, there is no need for you to waste your energy on this well. What about the rest of you? Will you follow me? And Lord Galcian? Okay, Belize not being committed one way or the other just yet. As for Vigoro, though, it doesn't make any difference to me. As long as I get to fight, I don't care who's in charge. So, uh, right, Vigoro's on board. And I will stay in the Armada as well. I still haven't finished building the ship that can go into Deep Sky. So alright, DeLoco wants to stay, he wants to see where this is going. <laughs> and also if I stay in the Armada, I'll probably get to fight a Vise again. So okay, some Admirals staying, some not sure. And speaking of not sure, right, Gregorio is not saying anything for now. So Gregorio, what are you planning to do? And Lord Gaussian, what is your goal? I do not think that you are seeking the Imperial Throne, so what is it you want? <laughs> and you are correct, that is not my goal. I want more power, more control than Valor has ever had. That is all I will say for now. Lord Gaussian, what are you up to? So okay, Alfonso seems to be, you know, pretty much out. Gregorio and Beliza, not sure. Vigoro, Ramirez and Deloco, most definitely in. A cocking civil war basically just broke out in Valois. Meanwhile up top, yes, we found a nice out of the way area we just might be able to sneak into. So, right, before we do anything, hang about. I'm pretty sure I just saw, yes, in the corner of my eye over there. One moonfish, make sure we grab you, buddy. 
Still, I would say yes. It feels like everything's suddenly kicking off as we begin Skies of Arcadia's amazing final act. Gaussian has rebelled against Valois, and I'm about to try and sneak into a base where literally every Admiral is currently hanging out. So, on that cliffhanger, how about we wrap things up there and crack on next time? Where, yes indeed, if we're lucky, we might just be able to get our hands on some schematics that could get us down into deep sky. So hopefully you join me for that. But in the meantime, I've been John. This has been Many a True Nerds. And this has been Skies of Arcadia. Thank you very much and goodbye. If we just hide the bodies, nobody needs to know about this. Yes, my stupid, stupid plan has worked. It turns out I'm a genius. The giant rat scorpion is not gone. Oh, hang on, there's, there's more yet, though. I'm still being very shocked. Guys, where's the NCR? Nobody needs to know.